Welcome to the 20th episode of Certain Group's podcast, Alternative Litigation Strategies, where we interview esteemed members of the bar from top law firms, companies, and legal institutions all around the country. On this program, we discuss the latest litigation, funding, and settlement trends and strategies that are currently happening across the full spectrum of commercial and other types of litigation. Today, we have an exciting topic as we're going to take a dive into the world of litigation funding and specifically discuss what funders and lawyers should do or stop doing to be better deal makers during their funding discussion. This is your host, Kevin Skrzowski, a director with the litigation consulting firm Certum Group. And today I am pleased to be joined by my colleague and co-host, Certum Group Legal Director, Kirsten Rogers. Good afternoon, Kirsten. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for having me. And Kirsten and I are very pleased to be joined by today's guest, Rebecca Barabee, a Chambers-ranked litigation finance consultant and broker, and the founder and CEO of Avenue 33, a litigation and finance consultancy. Rebecca, it's a pleasure to have you on the program today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Wonderful. Now, today we're going to take a deep dive into deal making in the litigation finance sector, but I know that your legal career did not start in litigation. Tell us a little bit of your background first. What did you do at the beginning of your legal career and how did you transition into legal finance and found Avenue 33? Yes, that's a great question. I started my career as a private equity mergers and acquisitions lawyer. So that meant real private money deal making. When you think about it from that perspective, you know, it did take me a little bit to get into the litigation finance world, but litigation finance really is a natural progression from that because litigation finance is at its core private money deal making. Funders are using private capital and making investments into companies, entities, individuals, and law firms. And that is exactly, you know, the same type of transaction as any kind of private equity deal structure. You know, that's really interesting. I never actually thought of it that way, but it does really make perfect sense. So was that what attracted you to the industry the most or what really was it that drew you from practice into forming your own company? That's a great question. So I went from practicing law at a law firm to being an in-house lawyer and then ultimately to being a business person on a litigation finance team. So I sort of stopped practicing law by the time I went into funding which was in 2016. And really the reason I ended up founding Avenue 33 was because as a funder, I kept seeing over and over that the users of litigation finance, meaning the lawyers and the litigants, had really very little idea as to what litigation finance actually is and how it actually works. I would be sitting across the table making a deal with someone and they would be asking me, are these terms fair? And, you know, having made a lot of deals in my career, I knew that if the person who I'm negotiating against is asking me if the terms are market, that they really didn't have the expertise to be negotiating that deal in the first place. So that was why I decided to pivot a little bit and found Avenue 33 so that I could really help the users of litigation finance sort of come up to the knowledge base of the funders so that we could make a productive deal that everyone felt really good about. And hopefully the goal is to make them more efficient as well by really increasing the level of knowledge on the user side. So Rebecca, that kind of brings us to where you are now and what you do at Avenue 33. Can you sort of explain to us who do you generally interface with and what is it that you do in your role? Sure, it's a great question. So I act as sort of a consultant and broker to all players in the litigation finance space. And that means, you know, that can be very broad. That means law firms, that means funders, that means litigants, and it means a lot of other legal providers. I deal with, you know, experts, I deal with valuation people, I deal with investigators, really everyone involved in the litigation industry who is interested in finance and getting their jobs paid for is really very interested in litigation finance. And that's where I sort of step in. I help create deals. I help law firms and litigants, you know, figure out if they have a marketable transaction that can be financed. And then I help prepare them for the finance world and consider a variety of strategies. And depending on what the case or portfolio or matters look like, I take them to, you know, the appropriate funders because not all funders are the same. They have different mandates. They have different expertise. And, you know, 
it can be a real shot in the dark when clients just sort of Google litigation funds and send out sort of arbitrary materials. I can help them really create a much more targeted approach to bring their matters to the parties that actually will be interested. And then once we have those matters under NDA with those funders, then I can really help as sort of a go-between to really make the deal as effective for all the parties involved as possible so that ultimately we can close these matters and move on to the good stuff, which is the actual litigation. Do you find that there's one group that sort of needs more education or more sort of just familiarizing with the litigation finance process than the other, or is it just person dependent? When I first started in 2016, the lawyers were still very much in the dark about how this industry worked. And so they required a lot of assistance. I will say the market has done a good job of educating the lawyers out there as to what litigation finance is. It is not a perfect world. Litigation finance has not educated everyone yet, but definitely there are more lawyers on board and understand the process better than they used to. The litigants, for the most part, though, I still find are first-time users of litigation finance. So they often come to the table with very little knowledge other than you know, they like the idea that they don't have to put out all the capital to pay for a lawsuit. And there still are many law firms out there that are still figuring out how to use litigation finance. I should hope, and I do hope that the bulk of the litigation funders really do know the industry and know how it works. I will say, though, there are still some funders that are sort of new and are, you know, kind of climbing up the curve a little bit. And I also think, you know, a lot of funders are different. And so it's important to kind of understand that, you know, one strategy isn't necessarily better or worse than another strategy. They're just different, different mandates, different risk profiles. And so, There's still, you know, some funders are excellent, for example, in IP and others won't touch IP with the 10 foot pole, but would love a great class action. So, you know, it really depends on the expertise of the funder and what they know. But I would say for the most part, the funders are the best well-educated in this industry, at least. Right. So, and I've learned this a little bit through talking with you and others that one thing that we need to be mindful of, we're generally on the funding side, our capital providers, and as you say, have certain mandates and requirements and requests and wishes. But one thing that you've done an excellent job reminding me of is that everyone's sort of coming to the table with different needs, different hurdles, different priorities. So I think it might be helpful to just talk about the different parties at the table, including the broker, because I think that's an important party to the table, even though technically they're out of the deal once it's done, about just the hurdles that each party faces to making that negotiation successful. And then also, what's the most important thing that, that, for example, what's the most important thing to the client or the client's lawyers? We'll kind of lump them together. I know that we on the funding side, and as you know, can see counsel coming for funding, client coming for funding, some combination thereof. So can we just sort of go through each of those parties and talk about what you think might be the biggest hurdles that they face, or maybe what's the most important thing to them when they come to the table, starting off first with the client or the litigant or their account. And if there are distinctions between those, let's talk about those two. Well, I think as you alluded to, typically there are three parties at the table, right? It's the fund, the lawyers, and the client. And you're right. It really does depend on the situation, whether the lawyers themselves are looking for financing or the client. But I think you are also right in thinking that those two can easily get lumped together because we think that their interests are the most aligned of the three parties you know, at the table. I will just take a quick note and remind everyone that depending on how the deals are structured, they're not always signed by all three parties. The legal documents are not always signed by all three parties, but it is certainly best practice and very typical that all three parties are aware of the terms of the deal. That I think is actually quite important. But having said that, I do think that the client, if we're talking about the client slash lawyer, they're coming into the deal kind of, we hope, believing that they have a really strong case or portfolio of cases that really deserves to be heard in court, right? And of course, they want to do the best they can to not have to pay, 
right? To avoid some of the risk of paying for the bringing the lawsuit. But at the same time, you know, we've got to think that they're economically rational players and they want to pay as little as possible for, you know, that de-risking of, of the case, right? I mean, it's that at its fundamental level, clients are looking for the cheapest way possible to get their case paid for. The economic reason aside, those individuals are the ones that come with the most emotional humanizing ties, right? That, yes. that despite the fact that this is a financial transaction, those clients have a tie to the case that no one else at the table has. And we on the funding side should be mindful that it's likely something extremely significant to them. In addition to the economics, there is a personal human element to that work from the client's perspective. That is a great point. And I'm glad you said it. I completely agree with you. It depends on the case, but always you can assume that the plaintiff is going to have the most emotional attachment to these cases. And especially in the cases where the plaintiff is an individual. I mean, then it is very, very personal. But even in the cases where it's a company, you know, typically this is some issue that has gotten come to a head that requires some type of dispute. And therefore, the company has been very embroiled in some uncomfortable situation, certain instances for years. And it can be very, very frustrating. And a lot of the time, these companies and these litigants have a lot riding on these litigations. And you're absolutely right. It does get personal. So there is an economic rationality that we're talking about, but sometimes, and you're absolutely right, the sort of emotional turmoil surrounding a dispute, which is perfectly natural, can sometimes cloud judgment a little bit. I completely agree with that. And I do think it's really important that the funders recognize that because the funders come to the table in a completely different way. I mean, even the most moral and wonderful and kind-hearted funders out there like you all, you know, mm -hmm. are coming to these as business deals, right? To, to us, decision. it's yep. about numbers. You know, funders want to make sure that they are going to put their money into a situation that will not only return their capital, but will also provide them with an upside return, right? That is the primary and almost singular goal of these investments. When I'm dealing with litigants, actually, one thing I tell them at the very outset, particularly with litigants who are new to this world, as pretty much most are, I remind them that when they're talking to funders, they should be thinking about how the funders are really economically motivated. In telling the truth, obviously, I always encourage everyone to give the full picture and be fully transparent, but they need to be thinking about how does it make sense right? For me to get an investment, am I going to be able to return more than that investment back, right? I have had circumstances where, you know, clients have come to me and said, I need $5 million to bring a case that will return $7 million. And I say to them, why would you bring that case? And why would a funder put their money in it? It has to be economically rational. And that is really how I try to remind my clients, the litigants and the lawyers, from day one to remember to keep this, thinking about this and speaking about this from an economic perspective. So this may be oversimplifying it, but essentially as a broker, as somebody who, or as somebody who's been consulting and bringing people together, you are faced with one party on one side of the table who's trying to make the most profit and the most money, maximize their return. And on the other side of the table, have someone give away the least amount, amount of the pie that they possibly can, right? So what do you do and what do you find makes it easier for you to do your job? What gives can each side be willing to make in the negotiation process? Where are the flex points where you can find movement in that? It's a great question. I think sort of in the litigation finance industry historically, and by the way, it doesn't have a very, very long and deep right. rich history. This industry has really only been championed in the past like decade, but I would say even in the past three to four years, there's been a tremendous explosion. So there is not you know, a huge history of this. I would say that the reality is there used to be less competition on the funder side. And so litigants and law firms would come in with a lot less leverage and would really have to kind of accept if I want to take on financing, 
I have one funder and this is the deal they're offering. Maybe I can negotiate around the edge, but this is probably what the deal is going to look like. In this day and age, there are a lot of funders. And I will tell you, the cases that are hard will maybe only get one or two offers. But the cases or portfolios that are strong will get many offers. So it is no longer true in the very good cases that the litigant slash law firm has no leverage. Okay. I really want to point that out because I really believe that. The truth is, though, the way that the funders can really distinguish themselves, I think, comes down to yes, economics. Although I will tell you, I've most of the times where I've seen real bidding wars where there are a lot of offers for one investment, the economics look very similar, to be totally mm-hmm. honest. They really do. Sometimes they're structured a little bit differently. Some funders are better than others at listening to what the client wants, right? If the client thinks that they're going to have a huge, huge return, they probably don't mind giving a bunch of money out at the, at the bottom end and saving a lot of the upside for themselves. If everybody feels like they're pretty confident what the return is going to be, they're probably going to want a better split all the way through to the top of the return. It also depends on insurance. There's a lot of other factors here. But I do think the economics tend to come out fairly similarly. What ends up making the decision is, honestly, this is going to sound so ridiculous and basic, but really it's about how much respect each of the funders has shown over the course of the litigation finance you know, bidding process. What does that mean? Yeah. So respect I think for time, respect for the emotional part, what does that overall look like? I think it's both, but I will be honest with you. The number one thing that I see that makes or breaks deals other than economics is communication. The funders that are contacted, express interest, and then go dark for three weeks are not going to be championed by the client. The funders that engage and respond, and that doesn't necessarily mean they have to rush, right? It can be as simple as an email that comes through that says, I know we spoke a week ago. I haven't had a chance to look at this yet, but I'm very excited to do so. And I will be in touch with you by next Wednesday. Or what about a, we're still digging into this. We're still very interested. We just need a little more time. It's less. Any kind of update is well received. The funders that go dark, really, honestly, people get angry because all of these cases, I mean, I'm sure in your experience, this is really my experience too. Everybody wants their case funded yesterday, right? Everything is always a rush. Even when it's not a rush, it's a rush. And, you know, while I think part of my job is making sure that everybody's comfortable with the fact that nothing is going to get funded yesterday, right? It is a process that does take a good chunk of time. And I think everybody has to be cognizant of that. The reality is dropping off the face of the earth for a while is really, honestly, it's rude. And these deals, you know, are very long term. I mean, a lot of these cases go for a year, two, even five, seven years, depending on the situation. And so, you know, this is not like a corporate M&A where you kind of dig in hard for the deal and then, you know, you buy a company and the old management is out and you never talk to them again. That's not how these deals work. These are partnerships, effectively, whether or not they're structured like that from a legal perspective. These are partnerships and you need to have a level of trust with your partner. And the trust begins literally at the first contact with the client, right? I mean, without trust, these deals do not move forward. And we all know that litigation, you know, by its nature is unpredictable. And no matter how many smart and experienced brains you have considering these cases, matters and issues and expenses pop up, right? Later down the line. And those issues are much better handled when a funder and the client have a very good relationship that has begun from the beginning, as opposed to an angry situation. The worst case scenario is to get into a deal where the parties are already antagonizing each other before you even right send the money over. It doesn't bode well for the long-term relationship. And that's one reason why I've always found your background so interesting, because I think this concept of coming to the table with trust and forming trust is sort of anti everything that litigators were trained to do. 
Mm-hmm. And you came from a different background where you had to start making deal and uh, making, trying to find common ground from the beginning, which is why I think your advice to anyone who's listening is so critical because some of this involves us rewiring our brains to start off in a position of how do we make this work? How do we get to yes? Versus a lot of litigation is how do I protect only my interests? And it's not necessarily about resolution. Although I think more experienced litigators do learn that resolution and trust and all those things are equally important. It's certainly not our default. And that's the perspective I think that you bring to this industry that is so critical. And I know that there are others in this industry who come from an M&A background, but a great majority of us sitting on either side of the table are still litigators at heart and trying to figure out where the trick is, right? (laughs) What's going on? And the concept of communication, that's not encouraged in litigation, right? It's batten down the hatches and figure out your strategy and keep everything secret rather than that free flow of information which is one reason I thought it would be so great to talk to you on this podcast, because I think your insight is really critical to all of us. So thanks for that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I think there's a lot to be said. I've seen a lot of um, litigators as you have come into the industry and provide expertise, but I do think that, you know, deal-making is a real part of this industry and, you know, some of the skills are soft skills as opposed to hard skills, but, you know, private equity firms, you know, they go out to lunch with their potential investees and a lot of litigation funders, you know, don't do that. There's a lot more relationship building I've seen in more traditional deal markets than in this one. And I think that is a vestige of the fact that a lot of these people in this industry have come from sort of a background of litigation. So Rebecca, one final question for you, just to give you the opportunity to make an overarching comment. What is just one thing that everybody at the negotiating table who comes together could do better today? It's a great question. And I think, you know, instead of just focusing on the investment and the economics, which of course deserve a significant amount of attention, but I think what's really important in the communication is A, being responsive and B, really listening and putting ourselves in the shoes of the other party across the table, because it will really smooth over the communication. And as I alluded to before, it can actually make for better economic deals where people really are able to satisfy the other party's needs better, sometimes even without sacrificing our own. So I think communication listen, be respectful. And, you know, these are very, very basic concepts. But, you know, they're not always put into practice. So I have a significant amount of faith in this industry that the deal making level is already increasing and will continue to. I think that was incredibly well said and a great way to wrap up this program. What a terrific discussion. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, Rebecca, for joining us today. It was a real pleasure. I appreciate your time and really all the great insight and ideas you shared with us in the audience today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, if anybody would like to contact you to further discuss what we covered here today, what would be the best way to reach you? You can always reach out via email, which is Rebecca at Avenue33LLC.com. You can also find my website at www.Avenue33LLC.com. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, And of course, as always, I'd like to thank the audience for listening. If you'd like to hear more, please be sure to follow us on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. If you'd like to listen to a recording of today's program or like to learn about any litigation insurance, premium finance, or funding solutions that the Certum Group provides, please visit our website at www.certumgroup.com, or you can always reach out to me directly at kevins at certumgroup.com. Thank you for listening. 